Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. This is a specific brand of Paleocrat Diaries. We're calling this Canon 211. I'll explain more about that later. Before I get any further down the road, I want to introduce to Meaning of Catholic viewers a very special guest. This is Dr. Rodney Hauser. Dr. Hauser, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. An honor. Yeah, it's, it's well, I'm, I'm honored as a matter of fact because uh, I have benefited from your work. I've read a number of your articles. I've consumed uh, more online content than I care to share via Gaudium at Spes22.com, Larry Chapp's uh, apostolate, his, his blog and his YouTube channel. Um, it's no secret. I'm a fan of Chapp. Uh, you know, we, we talk from time to time. He's sort of like, uh, you know, he's like my dad's age, so I could I I, I lean on Larry for <laughs> for uh, for sound advice, and I, I I bounce ideas off of him, and I try to criticize his videos. No, I'm I'm kidding about that. Um, but no, so Dr. Hauser, Rodney, I I truly have benefited from your work, and I think others can benefit from it as well. Hence, why I reached out to you. You wrote, uh, you've written a number of things, but recently you wrote an article in the winter 22 issue of Comunio entitled God's universal salvific will and the mission of Comunio. I read this article, gosh, it was about a year ago when the issue finally hits your mailbox, you know, mm -hmm. and it struck me in such a way that I immediately read it again. I don't normally do that. If I, if I go back to reread something, I give it some time, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, even a year or two. But with your article, there was just something about it. Uh, I, I immediately read it again. And then I've read it a third time and a fourth time in preparation for, uh, for this show. So uh, I, should, I should say who you are, and then I really should stop talking so that you can dazzle us with your intellect. Uh, Dr. Hauser, folks, is a professor of theology at DeSales University in Pennsylvania. He joined the faculty in 1999. He is tenured. He's been the department chair, and I understand, if I'm not mistaken, you're no longer the department chair. That's so correct. congrats, congrats mm -hmm. to you. Much less work for the same pay, I imagine. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, how it, that's how it goes in, in our school as well. The department head, you think, oh, this person must be really socking away the cash. No, no, it's the same amount. They just have to do more work. Um, he, he's written extensively, like I said, not only in Comunio, but he's written for journals such as Nova et Vetera and the Pro Ecclesia Journal. Uh, specialization, if you could call it that, in the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, who, who features largely in this article you wrote that we're going to discuss today. So um, with all that being said, Dr. Hauser, uh, welcome once more. And what can you tell me about the mission of Comunio and God's universal salvific will? Yeah, it's, um, th it's funny. This paper has sort of uh, has several incarnations and it's going to have yet another one. Uh, because we're, I'm, I'm turning it into a chapter for a book that's going to be published, um, edited by Margaret McCarthy and Nick Healy on the question of predestination, free will, grace, etc. Um, so, and uh, so that's that's kind of exciting because I'm going to have to expand on this and deal with uh, some counter arguments, uh, especially the work of David Bentley Hart, um, who is. Uh, um, you know, kind of a hardcore universalist. Everybody will be saved in his view. Um, sure. And that's not Balthazar's view. Uh, so I have to take him on a little bit, which is not fun to do because his intellect is is uh, rather capacious. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, um, it's, uh, it's interesting because what I had to do for this particular uh, uh, article um, is to tie in the question of God's universal salvific will with the mission of the journal Communio. And that's that's the first time I presented this was at the Academy of Catholic Theology to a room full of hardcore Thomists uh, about uh, <laughs> five years ago. So that was that was nerve wracking. Um, but uh, but it ended up turning out quite well. They were very gracious, uh, even some of their you know difficult questions. Uh, we, had, we had great conversation. Um, so at any rate, uh, let me just say a little bit about how those I think those two issues uh, work together, because the paper was originally just about 
is it possible for God to have a universal universal salvific will without everybody necessarily being saved? So that was like the big, that was the heart of the, the question. Um, but tying it into the mission of Comunio is interesting because it seems to me that what Comunio is trying to do over the years is to maintain a very, very high Christocentric approach everything is about Jesus Christ, um, which is a very, very particularist approach. This is one guy who lived 2000 years ago at a particular place in a particular time, who did particular things with a particular message, which seems to forfeit him the right to be able to speak to universal human questions, right? He, he, mm. uh, you know, according to the Enlightenment project, if, if reason is going to be universal, it precisely can't be embedded in a particular tradition, a particular faith or a particular revelation or something like that. In order to be universal, it has to prescind from all of those things. But what Comunio has always tried to insist upon and all of the great founders from Ratzinger to von Balthasar, to John Paul II, to Henri de Lubac, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing I think that we could say they have most in common is this insistence on the centrality of Jesus Christ. And uh, John Paul II in his encyclicals quoted Gaudium et Spes 22, every single encyclical as far as I know, which is a pretty interesting uh, fact, um, which is of course the passage that says, it's only in the mystery of Christ that we can understand the mystery of what it means to be human. That's a paraphrase. Um, <clears throat> so, so on the one hand, Comunio is very Christocentric, very explicitly theological. On the other hand, they insist that that doesn't in any way hurt their chances of speaking to human beings as human beings. Um, so how do you do this? How do you combine this radical Christocentrism with this attempt to have a say something universally appealing, universally interesting, universally relevant, if you, if you want to use that word. And that's been, you know, that's the very, very delicate balance that it's been very, very hard, I think, for the church to strike through history even, especially in, in modern times. And, and so in your article, you wrote that there are two false ways of living this out, Yeah. right? And they, they sort of both have a positive emphasis, but they overdo it and then end up with a consequence that's unacceptable, right? That's right, yes. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, and this is going to, this is going to um, be a characteristic of, of a great deal of pre-Vatican II Catholicism in the modern period. So I wanna be very explicit about what I'm talking about. So modern uh, Catholic theology, that would be theology since the 1600s, let's say roughly, um, prior to Vatican II, uh, tends to be characterized increasingly, especially as modernity gets kind of more and more obnoxious and more and more anti-Catholic. Um, it, it tends to develop a very defensive posture on the one hand to the world. So lots of encyclicals, lots of documents uh, condemning various kinds of isms in modernity, et cetera, et cetera, while doubling down on the inside of the church um, was what I would call a kind of constricted version of Orthodox Catholicism. And we could talk about that going forward, but a tendency to reduce uh, Orthodoxy to post-Thomistic theology understood largely through the commentators on Thomas. So, um, and to kind of double down on uh, making anything outside of those parameters uh, a dubious orthodoxy. And, and that's going to include to some degree neglecting the Eastern Church Fathers, uh, you know, neglecting reading scripture freshly for oneself, so to speak, to, uh, I mean, obviously within the tradition, but uh, to actually read scripture and, and try to learn new things from it and things like that, right? So there's a kind of uh, um, an attempt in a sense to turn Thomas into an answer machine Mm -hmm. right? which creates great security and great unity in the church. And that's, that's a good thing. We want unity in the church. Um, but at the expense of marginalizing other figures in church history that are also saints and doctors of the church and things like that, 
um, marginalizing to a large degree the Eastern church and and then at the same time having a kind of bunker mentality with regard to everything modern, right? So there's a kind of defining oneself over and against one's enemies. So that's the one side. That was a long answer, but but let me just quickly, yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. No, well, so that's uh, to sum up. It seems like it's a it, we're defining ourselves by what we're not. Yes, like we don't believe this, and we don't believe this, and we don't believe this. Yeah, so whatever's left, just check with the summa, and then there you go. Yes, absolutely. So, yes. Okay. Yep. Of course, since the council, um, and this is why communio starts. <laughs> by the way, the other tendency, which is the dominant one now, if you go to the Catholic Theology Society of America, this is almost hegemonically dominant paradigm, is to reestablish a strong connection between the church and the world, but at the expense of doctrinal specificity. So you end up saying again, like, so, so what I say in the paper is that really, in a sense, both sides are nostalgic for Christendom, but they're nostalgic in different ways. One side wants to just pretend Christendom is still happening and just pretend that the outside world hasn't lost its mind, <laughs> right? Because we're all kind of bunkered down. So it feels like inside the church, it feels like Christendom still. Um, but then the other approach, and this is going to seem uh, ironic because progressive Catholics are, are usually thought to just kind of like sell the thing down the, 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 the thing and they, they seem to hate Christendom. But in fact, I think they're, they're also nostalgic for Christendom because they're nostalgic for the approval of the world, right? They want the world to affirm what it is that Catholics teach. Unfortunately, they arrive at that goal by dropping all the Catholic distinctives that modern people find difficult. So they either don't talk about them or they marginalize them or they explicitly deny them or make them options or, you know, there's a variety of ways. Sure. What I would argue is that these two sides, although they seem opposite, actually have this really fatal flaw in common. And that is a desire to live in Christendom, even though we don't live in Christendom circumstances right anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm all for some kind of a return of Christendom, don't get me wrong, but, sure. but, but it isn't a reality yet. So it's not something we can kind of pretend is a reality. That's, that's how I would put it. We're working towards it, but we're, we have to do that in a way that avoids those two pitfalls, right? Yes. Which I think, again, you know, we talked a little bit before I pressed record. I, I am of the opinion that, you know, the, the path that Comunio scholars tend to chart seems to me to find, to, to thread that needle, just to, to strike that balance. Not every last person, right? Just because your name appears in an issue doesn't mean that you've got all the answers. However, I think the general trend, and it, I, I really believe this, I think that the general trend in what is broadly called communio theology is the healthy way for the church to move forward at this point. Um, with that being said, uh, something you you pointed out, actually, I wanted, I wanted to ask about, uh, let's see, talking about, uh, von Balthasar's identification of the problem. So this would be on page 783. If you have this issue at home, folks, uh, Dr. Hauser, you say, it seems that for Balthasar at the bottom of every failed pastoral strategy yeah. lies a deeper misunderstanding on the part of the church of her own faith. So Von Balthasar doesn't think that the problem is ultimately a pastoral one, but a theological one. It's a doctrinal one. Yeah. And you you made a statement, and I wrote in the margin. I said, "Is this most Catholics? Is this like, is this me? Is this you? Is this a general thing? Or what did you mean?" So I don't want to put words in your mouth when you say uh, a misunderstanding on the part of the church of her own faith. What are you referring to? Yeah. So. In this particular case, Balthazar seems to locate the problem at the area in the area of soteriology explicitly, right? So, that, I mean, obviously there are Christological dimensions to it, Trinitarian, you know, but but he focuses on the, the church's teaching on salvation. And the two extremes that I just talked about, the two kind of ways of, of, of missing being in the world without being of the world, which is, of course, what we're trying to do, strike that beautiful tightrope balance, uh, you know, of being in the world, but not being of the world. The only way we can do that is if we believe that what the church believes in its dogmas is of universal significance. Mm -hmm. 
If Jesus Christ is only relevant to Christians, then the church can't be in the world, but not of the world, right? It, it can be, it can be, it can avoid being of the world, but it certainly can't be in the world, right? So what I argue throughout the paper, and this is, we can get into the details of this, is at some point, Western soteriology took us down a path that I think led to this dysfunctional outcome. Um, and it begins with this very limited understanding of predestination. Um, and that, believe it or not, and I'm not sure how many Catholics are in the pew are aware of this. Most Catholics, if you ask them, they'll say, oh, no, no, God lets us choose. He lets us decide whether or not we reject it. You know, OK, great. I'm, you know, I'm glad you said that, except for you should realize that has not been the dominant soteriological <laughs> tradition in the church. Right. So from Augustine to Aquinas and, and on beyond uh, to the Jansenist, et cetera, et cetera, the dominant strain of soteriology in the Western church has been that God does not offer grace to all people prior to considering their merits. So even prior to considering their merits, God decides to withhold uh, sufficient grace um, uh, or efficient grace from some people. And we don't get to ask why, you know, that's, just, that's you know, God is God. He can do what God wants. And we just have to take our lumps, so to speak. If, if most people don't receive efficient grace because God decided not to give them, we should be thankful that anybody gets it. That's kind of the, that's the party line, so to speak. Right. Oh. And, I, and I think it's surprising <laughs> when I tell students this sometimes, or I even I'll speak to churches about this sometimes, people are kind of startled. They're like, no, that's, that's Calvinism. You know, or that's 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 what that's what Lutherans or Calvinists, hardcore Lutherans or Calvinists believe. That's not what Catholics believe, and and so that's an interesting conversation to start, actually. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So then, if that's not the case, uh, what does Balthazar see as? How how would he offer a corrective? Yeah. To that, right? I know he. I mean, I didn't know the man, but I can imagine he wouldn't have been so bold as to say, you know, Augustine is completely wrong and I alone have the answer. <laughs> but he is he is bold in his theology and he does say things um, that are striking at times. Mm -hmm. and, and this may be yeah. one of them where, uh, you know, it, it doesn't it's not Augustine directly that you treat <laughs> later. It's it's more Maximus uh, and Thomas. But Thomas is getting it from Augustine. Yeah. So how how would von Balthasar see the solution here? What, what, is he, what does he want to put forward as the, the, the balance? Yeah, so, so let me kind of answer, let me, let, let me answer this by answering kind of two distinct questions, if I may, because I think there's, sure. there's things yes. going on at the same time here that, are, uh, that need to be kept distinct, but they're intimately related. The one goes back to my comment about the truncation or the shrinking of tradition, right? So, so, you know, up through the high middle ages, the Eastern fathers were very, very much had a voice in, in the Catholic tradition. And if you read the Summa of Thomas, Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, John the Democene, you know, we can go through, you know, and then also the Platonists, uh, you know, and Platonism is, is very much a factor in his theology. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it, it has been argued that the entire a structure of the Summa is on the exitus from God and the reditus, the return to God, which is a very Neoplatonic way of understanding reality, right? So there's a almost a Platonic structure to the entire Summa. Um, Dionysius the Areopagite is, is a dominant presence uh, throughout the entire Summa, and Thomas defers to him over and over again, and he is about as Neoplatonic as it gets. I mean, it's it's uh, it's sometimes when you're reading Dionysius, you're wondering, okay, where are the Christian bits, right? <laughs> he, he has them for sure, but he's very much in the Neoplatonic tradition, and he, I mean, it's it, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so the first piece then is to to kind of regret to some degree the shrinking down of the tradition to this Augustinian through Thomas through uh, you know, the, this, this, this trajectory and a kind of crowding out of these other voices that I think are ex important complements uh, and important correctives in some cases. So it just has to be the case that, and Thomas would be the first to admit this and anybody with any sense, Thomas can't be right about everything, right? Or, or else we wouldn't need tradition, we wouldn't need scripture, we wouldn't need any of that. So we, have, we could just give it to one guy to constantly pronounce on the, on the truth of everything. So to try to reduce a 
massive 2000 year tradition like the Catholic one to one voice, I think is, is dangerous. And, and, and I'm not saying that anybody literally did that, you know, but there was a tendency to kind of, uh, to kind of go that path and to sort of define Catholicism in this Thomistic way over and against the Franciscans, the Jesuits, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the, and the Eastern fathers and, and all of those things, that's the kind of big theological statement. Soteriologically, what happens is the West tends to get dominated by a move that's made by Augustine, um, and it's a brand new move. Um, it's a it's a new reading of of Paul. When I say new, of course, I'm talking about in the you know the late 300s, uh, so it doesn't seem new to us. But at the time, it was radically new, and and many many monks in the Catholic Church were very very startled and scandalized by Augustine's uh, theology of election. Um, which is just has that. So what happens at that period, Tom, uh, Augustine comes up with this very controversial reading of Paul, where he they suggests that God, again, prior to consideration of merits, simply just doesn't give grace to some people. And that's totally God's prerogative. That again, they're like, what? That can't be. That's just sounds mean. That sounds terrible. How could a loving God do that? Right. So I want to emphasize the fact that ever since Augustine proposes this thesis of, uh, uh, in the middle of his theological career, let's say, um, uh, there has always been in the Roman Catholic Church enormous pushback. And that's going to lead all the way up to the modern period when the Jesuits and the Dominicans are having their big battles over predestination. Benedict the Fifteenth called a truce, said he was going to solve it, um, and never got around to solving it. So we still don't have a resolution to this in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I have Thomistic friends who are still very much God doesn't give grace to some people because God doesn't, he decides not to. And that's God's prerogative. And, uh, and then of course I have other Catholic friends that think that's terrible um, and, and disagree. So that the, what I want to emphasize is the fact that the, the church has never resolved this question definitively. Um, although I think there's been some movement in, in the 20th century towards um, correcting the Augustinian position, and we could get to that later. But so, so, so my first point would simply be to say that what Baltazar is trying to do in his book, for instance, Dare We Hope, which everybody thinks he's, you know, a heretic and he's a universalist and all this. Isn't stuff. that the one that says that everybody goes to heaven no matter what? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the allegation, yeah. right? Yeah, right. <laughs> all he's trying to do in that book is open up the conversation between both sides of the debate again. So the debate has always had two sides. One side kind of got crowded out. The Eastern Fathers got totally forgotten for the most part. And all he's doing is opening up the conversation again, which is clearly within the bounds of orthodoxy to do. And I also think it's helpful, especially if maybe Augustine did misread Paul. I mean, there's a possibility there, right? So, um, and, and if we compare his reading of Paul to say Maximus the Confessor or to Gregory of Nyssa or to some other people, we find that they're, they're, very, they're very, very different. Yeah. And again, even in Thomas's day, there was pushback against the Augustinian reading. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, to, to kind of put these pieces together, yeah. when I was reading uh, through your paper, I noticed that uh, it seems like what you're, you're wanting to draw out of von Balthasar is a correction of Maximus and of Thomas in a way that, I mean, you, you said it yourself, you're helping Maximus, be better at at being Maximus and Thomas being a, better at being Thomas, right? Yes. How how can we how can we take that and tie it into the mission of Communio as a journal and as a like a movement, if it can be called that? Yeah, maybe let me start by by that that last question there, kind of the mission of Communio, and the, and then I think also that obviously Communio is trying to be faithful to the mission of the church, right? They're, they're trying to do this from the heart of the church. There's been an accusation from various quarters against uh, von Balthasar's thought that if you hope that all human beings be, be saved, your urgency for evangelization is gonna radically diminish, right? You're, why am I gonna go around preaching the gospel if everybody's gonna go to heaven anyhow? Sure. So the first thing to be said of that, of course, is that Balthasar never ever says that everybody's going to heaven. He's, ap he's apodictic that he doesn't believe that. What, what tends to happen from his critics is they say, that's what he says, but it's not what he means. And I just don't, then 
I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, you, you, you're saying that he has this thing that in his in his heart or something that he's never expressed in writing, but you know it's there. And I just think that's crazy. I think you have to take, a, when a person's dead, we got to look at their writings. So all I can do is tell you what Balthazar says in his writings. And he never says that everybody's going to be saved. Well, um, and I've heard Chap talk about, um, I haven't read this for myself, but Larry has talked about how uh, Balthazar's writings on hell yeah. are extremely severe. Yes. And it, so that seems to me, you know, I used to be a cop. And so I, I look for evidence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that seems to me to be evidence that he, he thinks that's a threat. If you, if I didn't think this was a problem, why do yes. I spend so much time and effort making it sound scary? Yes. Yeah. But the fact that he does deal with it in such a solemn way, it's like, yes. okay, that's an indication that he doesn't simply believe in a hard universalism, like no. vis a vis somebody like Hart. Exactly. Yep. Yes. No, that's, that's right. So that's the first thing to be said. But the second thing to be said that, that I think is very important here is there's a sense in which if I believe that perhaps even the majority of human beings have not been offered grace by God for various reasons, that, that, uh, that, um, You may have frozen a little, uh, Rodney. Am I you, back yet? You're, How are okay. you? I think you're back now. Yeah. Can you okay. just repeat the last maybe 15 I, seconds? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the, the question, the point would be then, if I assume out of the gate that some people are not going to be offered salvific grace, it seems to me much easier to give up on the world if I believe that. Because I could just say that the people that are in this little club called Catholicism are obviously the elect because we're going to church and we're doing the rituals and we believe the right things. And the people out there that are engaging in, in diabolical uh, ideology and all those things, and, and oftentimes they are, we, we don't want to deny that, they're, cl they're clearly not the elect. And so it seems to be much easier to wash my hands of the world if I believe that the majority of people are not elect than it is if I believe there's a possibility everybody's elect. If I'm hopeful that everybody is elect, then I have a real urgency to reach out to those people, to never give up on them. No matter how bad they get, I can't say, you know what, you're obviously damned. I can't help you anymore. Sure. And I think that was Chesterton's approach. You know, Chesterton never gave up on George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells. These are all total pagan friends of his. And he loves them to the end. And, they, and they're heartbroken when he dies because of that. Um, that is, seems to me, it, it, and I think it's because Chester has the exact same soteriology. He, he's also hopeful, you know, that, that, that everybody will be saved. And that doesn't diminish his evangelical zeal. It increases his evangelical zeal. And I think that's how I would describe Communio. They're, they're, the reason that they're so confident that they can engage anyone in dialogue is because there's hope on their part that that person is also somebody that God would like to see in heaven, you know? So mm -hmm. why would they give up on the person if, if God hasn't given up on the person, if I could put it that way? So then that uh, that kind of brings us back around to the, uh, the, it's a striking paradox between the universal and the particular. Yes. Like if, if we are literally reaching out to the whole world and we want, everyone to be in communion with one another yeah that has to be founded on something yes right so it's, it's almost as if um the the paradox is that in order to be universal there has to be something specific yeah does that make sense is that what so that's what i was kind of getting from from your your article is that because of the unicity of christ because yes. of the uh sort of a scotistic flavor of the absolute priority of Christ. Yeah. That's the, the means by which we can achieve this universalism yeah. at all. If, if it's going to be achieved at all, it has yeah. to be done this way. That's so right. then that makes um, the, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, again, painting with a broad brush, that, that makes the, uh, the modern, period of theology prior to Vatican II, the, the neo-scholastic period, we could call it. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've emphasized Christ. Yes. But at the expense of reaching out, right? 
yeah. in some way. And then yeah. the the flip side would be post Vatican II, uh, what I, I've heard called the silly season, right? Which we're we're, we're still in, but we're we're coming out of it. Uh, where you want to de-emphasize Christ in order to find that universality. Mm -hmm. But then when you when you find the universality, like I was in conversation, for example, with uh, a gentleman from India recently. And he, he said, look, I'm not very religious, but this is what, you know, my, my, my people believe, uh, very Hindu, but ultimately it's one God and it's this, and it's this, and you try to reach Nirvana by denying yourself. And well, that's all great. But if we can try to find some common ground, but ultimately it's not the Messiah, what is the point of the common ground? Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's that, that striking paradox that I think uh, Balthazar identifies that you identify yeah. that Comunio tries to put forward. Right. right. Can you, can you say some things about how this shapes, uh, your work, uh, Comunio's work in general, like this, yeah. this, it's like the one in the many, you know, yeah. I fear I'm talking too much. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. No, that's very helpful. Actually. Your questions are excellent. Um, yeah, this has been the fundamental problem of all great worldviews and religious traditions is on the one hand, there's this transcendent, atemporal, spiritual, you know, et cetera, et cetera, unchanging, you know, order that we can get a glimpse of even in this order, right? We see order within the, within the movements of things, you know, the planetary order and, you know, and then we see the soul within the body. We can discern a, a, something more than just the body, right? So, so we have that dimension which Plato, of course, speaks to beautifully. Um, but we also are aware of this other dimension, the dimension of change and decay and the body and time and you know, et cetera, et cetera, the fleeting stuff. Um, how do you get those two reconciled, right? That's, the, that's always been the big question. And one of the things that Balthazar sort of implies, or not implies, he, he just states it in the book, Dare We Hope, All Men Be Saved, um, actually, it's just dare we hope in German. It doesn't have the all, that all men be saved. That's not in there. That's that's important, actually. Sort of like clickbait before yeah, there was clickbait. Yeah, that's a little <laughs> bit of a marketing uh, a tool there on Ignatius Press's part, which there, I love Ignatius Press, so I'm not going to throw any shade. But anyhow, um, uh, so so what Balthazar is, is sort of getting at is that there's a sense in which the Christian tradition, even from the fathers all the way up through the Middle Ages, is still kind of bedeviled by that platonic approach that um, the divine sort of overwhelms the human. In order to get to the divine, we have to kind of get away from the human, if you want to put it that way, right? So it's, it gets a little bit okay. Buddhist or Hindu, right? In Platonism, um, in order to become one with the one, I have to cease to be an individual self in a body, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Right. right. So, as much as Christianity, of course, knows that's not true, there is still a tendency to use that philosophy and to be and to be um, allow that philosophy to even influence your theology. So there, so Augustine's philosophy of freedom sometimes is overly Platonist, meaning that it's overly the divine will always overrides the finite human will. What Balthazar is going to find in Maximus the Confessor that is very attractive is precisely this defense of the two wills of Christ in, in the monothelite uh, controversy, right? So this is why Maximus is so central to Balthazar's work. And what Maximus is going to insist on against the monophysites and the mon monothelites or monothelites, what do you want to call them, um, is that Christ has both two distinct natures both, neither of which are overwhelmed by the other, neither of which are compromised by the other. They're not confused, you know, nor are they separated uh, uh, per Chalcedon. Um, but however, he also, it, it comes up later, the mon monophysites come back with another heresy and say, oh, well, he might have had two natures, but he only has one will. Sure. Right. And, and, and of course, that gets into enormous problems, too. And Maximus is just a biblical guy. He's just like, well, wait a second. What's Jesus sweating bullets for in the Garden of Gethsemane? Right. <laughs> you know, if there's only one will going on there. Right. So um, his human will really does seem to be up against it. He seems to be he really doesn't want to go through this. I mean, who in their right mind wants to be crucified? Right. So um, so that means that his human will wasn't simply overwhelmed by the divine will. There's a moment there of waiting 
And it's kind of like I, I, you probably experienced this in your mm -hmm. prayer. I not I know I do. Sometimes I'll come before God with an urgent uh, need or an urgent request, an urgent uh, something, and I'll pray and pray and pray and crickets. Right? You, you know what I mean? You're like, okay, <laughs> you know, anytime now, you know, give me the answer. You can answer that prayer for me anytime. It's interesting that Jesus kind of gets the same treatment in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, mm -hmm. if it's your will, Father, let this cup pass for me. And he's all night. He's struggling and sweating and 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 the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's it's because precisely the Father doesn't want to answer the question for him. He, he doesn't want to overwhelm Jesus's human will. He wants Jesus's human will to finally figure out. Oh, this is what's best. It, it, right, it isn't bad for me to give my life this way. It's it's actually good for me, even as a human being. It's good for me. So, right? all right. So then he, not to interrupt. Yeah, no. Our Lord, is it is it possible then that our Lord knew that? Like we often know what's best yeah. for us, but yeah. okay, we've got we've got some struggling to do then to will it. So yeah. it's it maybe maybe it isn't that Jesus didn't know that this was the plan. Or, or that this was actually what needed to happen. Right. But maybe it's okay because this will is in fact so human. Yeah. There, there's, you know, it has to play itself out in time and space. Yeah. It, it has to undergo this struggle. Yes. In order to freely arrive at at a decision, is that what that, you're trying to say? Right. It is absolutely human to desire to preserve one's life. Sure. If Jesus doesn't desire to preserve his own life, then there's something inhuman about him, right? That that's that's kind of key here. And it's interesting if you compare Socrates and Jesus in the moment of their of their respective deaths, right? And and in, in many ways they're similar. They're they're being killed for their convictions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Socrates is totally chill, of course, because he's a Platonist. He's his humanity is not going to get in the way of his divine soul. His his sure. he, the, the the horse is pulling the carriage, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And the carriage is just a burden almost at this point that you just have to leave behind. But Jesus actually doesn't balk that his divine that his human will wants to live, right? He he affirms the goodness of the desire to live, right? There's a there's a beautiful affirmation of the humanity of humanity there. Now, just to follow that up with a quick soteriological takeaway, if we may, and that is that Balthazar is going to have a much more profound understanding of God's respect for finite freedom than is Augustine. And, uh, and so there, Balthazar cannot uh, accept the notion that the divine will would ever simply override. There's a, doctrine in Thomism called the infrustrable will of God, that if God wants to save you, you can't frustrate that desire. Uh -huh. So there's almost like an irresistible grace there, right? And, okay. and that's, okay. that's another little dirty secret in the Thomistic tradition that, that people don't really don't talk about in the streets. Um, but it's, but it, 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 it does totally subscribe to the notion that the divine will overrides the human will in this, in this really fundamental way. And this is what Balthazar just can't, find evidence for in scripture. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to him, uh, you know, uh, theologically or philosophically. And it doesn't for him meet the standard of the Chalcedonian creed. There seems to mm. be a denial of one of the natures there. One gets overwhelmed by the other. So Balthazar's theology is Chalcedonian from beginning to end. That's what he loves about Maximus. Um, okay. and, and he wishes that that Chalcedonian Christology had had pride of place in Augustine's soteriology. Um, that's what Balthazar accuses Augustine of not allowing his Christology to drive his soteriology. Rather, his soteriology gets separated off. He works out this entire soteriology absent his Christology, if you will. Whereas Maximus works out his soteriology within his Christology, if I could put so, it that way. Yeah, so the, in, in your paper, you you kind of describe this as Augustine's uh, soteriology being centered on Adam. Yes. And Maximus and, and later von Balthasar centered on Christ. That's right. Which again, that seems like a more uh, done Scotus way of doing business. Like mm -hmm. let's start with Jesus yep. and work our way out from there. Not that Thomas don't do that. Right. Um, but they're, well, they're drawing different conclusions. So in, in a sense, yeah. they don't do that. Yeah. Okay.
Excellent. I'm trying to think, you know, there's, there's actually a couple other passages I wanted to, to sure. ask about if you don't mind, if you have time, no, no, no. We're, we're at about 40 minutes right now. Is that a, we're, I'm we're fine. Okay? I'm totally Excellent. fine. Yep. Okay. So a little further in the section called Maximus, the confessor and Thomas Aquinas on page 787. Yeah. We've got, uh, maybe about halfway down created nature is assured its proper autonomy precisely mm -hmm. in the yes. hypostatic union. Yeah. Even as the hypostatic union also reveals that created nature attains its full stature only when it gives itself over entirely to the divine. So th this struck me. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is something I picked up reading this journal and listening to, um, to theologians who, who write for communio is that there's this, uh, I hate to call it a meta narrative, but there's not really a better term right now. Um, th this structure of gift reception communion. That's, mm. it seems like that's present in that statement. So there's the gift of the incarnation, the gift of revealing to man what man truly is. Mm -hmm. And then in the reception of that on our part, like when we receive uh, baptism, when we receive the theological virtue of faith, hope, and love, when then we become fully ourselves. Yeah. And it's at that point when we can enter into a communion with God. We can't have communion with God if we aren't like our human nature isn't fully actualized in virtue of the incarnation. Right. And so I, I wonder if you could, you could maybe speak about that a little bit, especially in terms of how von Balthasar might see that structure of gift reception communion and how that may be related to uh, his hope that, that all men may in fact be saved. Yeah. I, so one thing I would do is draw on a, one of the most beautiful quotes in Thomas Aquinas. And I can never, I, I don't know exactly where it is. I know it's there because I copied it and, and, and I have it in a, in, a, in a folder right now. I saved the quote because when I teach Christology, I always pull it out. But Thomas says that the manner in which the son proceeds from the father is the manner, is the type, is the, is the prototype for how all beings should come from the father. Now, I want you to think about that. That's very interesting, right? So how does Jesus receive himself from the Father? Uh, you know, we're kind of with perfect gratitude. He, he, he's, not, he's not mad that he doesn't get to be the one who generates the Trinity. He's not like, why don't I get to be the one? You know, he, he receives his existence willingly without grasping after equality with the Father. Um, he returns the gift in absolute gratitude uh, with his own personal will, right? Is his distinct, or his, I shouldn't say that, that that's going to get me close to heresy with his own personality, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. There's only one will in the Trinity. Well, I, I, <laughs> okay. Um, the, you know, uh, right. So, but his own personality, right. He, he, he receives this in his distinct way, which is why you can't collapse into the Holy spirit or the father, all of these different things. Now, if the way the son comes from the father is the paradigm for the way we all come from God, then Christ is obviously the prototype of every human being. So I think we have in Thomas the principle that which leads Balthazar to say that he can hope all men are going to be saved. But then, I, but I, what I fear is that Thomas is too beholden to, to Augustine's soteriology. So I would actually say there's some tension in Thomas's work when he quits yes. doing soteriology and starts doing other things, he starts to sound very, very Christocentric. He starts to sound like Jesus Christ really is the paradigm and, and not Adam, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when he sits down and does soteriology, he has been totally convinced that Augustine has read Paul right. Um, and in fact, I, I don't know if you know this, but your viewer should know it. When Thomas wrote the sentences, uh, you know, that one of his early works, he said that God only withheld grace from people who he knew weren't going to use it well. So he considers their he considers their merits and then says, well, that guy's going to use it badly. So there's no reason for me to give him grace. Right. And then he changes his mind by the summa. So well, that that's, that would be contra Augustine then at that yes. point. Yeah. He hadn't so done that yet. Yep. By the time he gets to the summa, he's more Augustinian yep. and, and less uh, Maximian, we could say. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's exactly right. He, he, again, he swallows Augustine hook, line, and sinker practically in his soteriology. Um, 
where, where again, just to go back to what I was saying, what you were asking about the gift and the reception thing, it's almost as if in the Augustinian strain, what we're saying is, this is what God intended when he created the world, but Adam threw the whole thing off. And, and for the Eastern tradition, and, 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 and even for much of the Catholic tradition, that's just giving way too much credit to finite freedom, right? So on the one hand, you wanna to totally obliterate finite freedom by get, making this, this kind of doctrine of predestination. But on the other hand, you wanna give it so much power that it's able to thwart God's plan. Right, which is obviously uh, that's that, that seems to be deeply problematic. So when mm. one of the passages that Maximus loves is that passage in Peter that says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, even before God creates Adam and Eve, He knows what's going to happen. He's already got the crucifixion in mind. He's not surprised by Adam's. Oh no, now what? You know, it's like <laughs> that's that's not what's happening. Right? So, there's so so we don't want to make Adam the paradigm for the vast majority of humanity. Christ is the paradigm for every single human being. Every single human being is elect in Jesus Christ. And Adam's fall certainly can't take that away, right? It, it certainly is going to require now uh, the crucifixion, for instance, which, you know, wouldn't have had to happen, right? I mean, so it's, I'm not saying that the, that the sin of Adam makes no difference. I'm just saying it can't make the difference, if, if, if I can put it that way. Okay. That makes, yeah. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We get maybe 10 to 15 minutes left before sure. uh, we should go. In, yeah. in that time, I wonder, towards the end of your paper, you you sort of bring in John Paul II and Benedict the yeah. and you, you you give some examples, perhaps, of how they have appropriated von Balthasar's soteriology. Yeah. And maybe are offering this, I don't want to say in a magisterial way, but sort of maybe a little bit magisterial yeah. as, as the path that the church should explore. Right. Yeah. So how, how did, do, how does JP2 do this? How does Benedict do this? Where can we find that? Like, what's he writing that yeah. we can see reflections of, of von Balthasar? Uh, yeah. And then at the end, I just, I have like a, a question to, to tie it all together. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, so the um, the important John Paul II quote for your viewers um, occurs in his general audiences. So his his um, what we call theology of the body, right? Um, and it's on the mystery of predestination in Christ, and that's the title of that particular general audience, which is uh, May nineteen eighty six. If we're looking for the exact one, so okay. uh, May nineteen eighty six, and this is in the Communio Article. May twenty eighth. Okay. May right, so there you go, folks. If you want to look it up, May 28th, 1986. Yes. And it's very interesting. Even the title of the, of the thing is the mystery of predestination in Christ, right? So in talking about predestination here, John Paul II returns to that trajectory that wants to understand the mystery of predestination under the mystery of Christ, rather than separating predestination out and asking who is elect and who isn't. So, so it, it, he's going to take that back from that approach, right, um, and restore it back to its Christological center, I would say, right? And, and it has to be the case that, if, again, Christ is the prototype of all creation, then every human being is, is created in Christ Jesus to do good works, et cetera, et cetera, right? Every human being, not just a smattering or, or a few. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that every human being is going to be saved because John Paul II is very clear that God respects our, our will, our freedom. It, it, he calls all of us, but he doesn't force any of us to follow him, right? So there's going to be a deep respect in John Paul II for the freedom of the human being to reject God's offer. So for JP2, the offer is universal, but it is possible to, to reject it. That's going to that's gonna separate him from the Thomistic tradition on this question. Um, Benedict does the exact same thing, uh, and he does this in Space Salvi, uh, his, his uh, encyclical, where he bemoans the fact that in the West, at some point in the history of theology, beginning with Augustine, he, he, he actually throws Augustine under the bus a little bit. By the way, Balthazar and Benedict and David Bach love Augustine. I want to 
go on record. I mean, they're all, I think if you ask Benedict, what are you? He would say, I'm an Augustinian. I mean, he, he, and that sometimes frustrates Thomas that he's not more Thomistic than anything. He is an Augustinian. But on this question of predestination, he disagrees vehemently with Augustine. And he thinks that Augustine mistakenly reads Paul's problem of Gentiles and Jews and turns it into a question of individual salvation when that's not what Paul's mm. problem is at all. Paul's, Paul's question is, Am I, is it okay that I'm like getting all these Gentiles into the church? <laughs> like, but they weren't part of the elect? That's his question. So how do you justify the fact that these people who are not elect are being included in the kingdom of God? That's his mm. problem. Augustine actually turns that problem completely upside down. He gets it, 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 it entirely backwards. Um, because Paul is saying, no, even though they're not the rightful heir, we have all these precedents in the Old Testament of younger sons getting inheritances, and the Gentiles are like those younger sons. And why now would God do this? Why would he now have the Gentiles coming in? Is it because now he wants to throw the Jews under the bus? No, God wants the Jews to get jealous so that they too will return. Just like after Esau's birthright is given to Jacob, um, Esau and Jacob reconcile. They both become part of the thing, right? So it, this is not a matter of God electing some and rejecting others. It's it, Chapter nine of Romans sounds like that. That's all hypothetical stuff. The next two chapters make it very clear that it, the answer is just the opposite of that hypothetical quote. Does God reject some, Paul says? He answers that question later by saying he does not, right? So um, that's actually a really important point that I don't include in this paper but uh, it's fairly well established among Paul scholars now that Augustine radically misreads Paul there. And that, and, and God bless him. If I think the Bible is going to say something, I don't care what I think. The Bible is going to trump what I think every time. So you have to give kudos to Augustine for even though he didn't like the logic of what he was saying, he said, hey, who am I to trump revelation? Sure. That was his answer all the time. But the Bible says it. I, I mean, I'm, who, who am I to judge that? Right. So but the. What he didn't realize is he was misreading Paul. That's what he didn't. <laughs> so the Bible doesn't say that. So that's, that's key. Sure. But Benedict and John Paul II both reject that reading of Paul, and that's important. So uh, the, uh, the 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 passage from Space Salvi um, is uh, paragraph sixteen and seventeen. Okay, and th those are important to look at. And in both cases, we have two popes saying that God's will for salvation is universal, but that universal will can be rejected. So they're both preserving seriously the possibility of hell. And so that, yeah, so that you've, you've sort of anticipated then my, yeah. my final inquiry, which was, yeah. you know, you, you must be looking at the same section. Uh, even if unprepared, they, uh, JP2 and Benedict, even if unprepared to accompany Balthazar in every detail in these matters, Yep. They seem prepared to endorse his notion of a universal predestination. Mm -hmm. So all men are predestined to be saved. Yep. However, it leaves open the real possibility of a final rejection. Yes. So that stops short of yeah. uh, a hard universalism. Yep. But it, it but it's Balthazarian and it's uh, appropriates Maximus in the sense that uh, because of the primacy of Christ in the incarnation, uh, this is not there there is no one who is left unaccounted for it, right. from from god's perspective yep, yep. excellent and, and i think c.s lewis is actually really good on this stuff when he says things like the door to hell is locked from the inside and things like sure. that he i think has a very he's you know he's, he's not a, a technical theologian so to speak but he has great instincts uh for these things and, and again chesterton would be a guy that i think has a really good instinct on this too um, and both of them kind of come to it innocently. I'm not sure they even know too much about the Augustinian Thomistic, uh, you know, uh, trajectory or whatever. I think they just kind of like, well, this is just what makes sense to us. But if I can just maybe say one more thing that I think is important here. It's a technical question, but then it, it has a broader application. The question is whether Maximus is a universalist in the hardcore sense of, you know, apocatastasis, right? So, and Balthazar seems to think that he was, and Balthazar criticizes him for that. So that's another piece of evidence that Balthazar is not, because why would he criticize his beloved Maximus for being one if he, if he, if he was one, right? 
But however, I think there's actually good reason to doubt that that's true. There are some very important passages in Maximus where he says, hey, I don't get to make this call. God alone gets to make this call. Like, I, you know, I, 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 he definitely believes that all people are predestined in Christ for salvation, but he never makes the stride and claim that everybody is going to be saved. Um, and so the book I was telling you about at the beginning of this thing that's going to come out at some point, one of the chapters is going to be demonstrating that Maximus was not a universalist. And I think that is a little... Okay. Yeah, I think that, and I think that's a little bit of a problem for David Bentley Hart. I, I think that um, where Maximus is circumspect and kind of says, hey, this is a mystery. The mystery of divine and human freedom is way above our pay grade. You know, we can say some things about it, but we can't ultimately figure it out. He's very circumspect when he gets to that question. Hart is strident. He's dogmatic and he's strident. He knows that everybody's going to be saved. And I just think that is a betrayal of that Eastern deference before the mystery of God, to, to be honest with you. I think there's a, there's a kind of almost his philosophy <laughs> overtakes his theology a little bit at that, at that point, if I could say that. I don't want to make David mad. I hope he doesn't okay. watch. <laughs> uh, he, he has no idea who I am. Uh, I assure you. I am uh, I'm small potatoes in, in the Catholic world, but uh, well, you know, so that's, that maybe is a, a positive note to end on. So when is your contribution to this book? When, when is the book expected to be out? I might be the one holding the book up. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so basically I, it's on your terms. Right? Yeah, so I, I, I have to get my chapter done and I'm probably going to wait till summer to do that. So, but I haven't been, uh, I haven't had any people hounding me. So I'm assuming that there are other people in, in the same boat, you know, so. Uh, maybe, maybe they're just being polite. Maybe that could be it. Although Margaret's pretty tough. She's not, you know, <laughs> she's not afraid to tell me, Hey, get your paper in. So, uh, um, uh, but does it does it have a title? <sighs> predestination, divine election, predestination, and free will. I, you know, it's it's something along okay. those lines. Yeah, I could be wrong about that, but it's, that's the ballpark title. And okay. uh, yeah, I mean, you you can keep checking with uh, with Chap if you if you you know, um, you right. know he'll know uh, pretty early on when and where and what it's going to be called and kind of all that stuff. But uh, and, but it's already. Several essays written. DC Schindler is going to have an essay in there on freedom, which I think is going to be really important. Where I think he's going to critique David Bentley Hart's view of freedom. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Which publisher is this going to be through? And we don't know that yet either. So I think. Oh, okay. So not, this is very early on. All right. Well, it's not. Uh, mea culpa. Yeah. It, 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 a lot of the chapters are already written. It's just a matter of getting the few final ones and then sure. also okay. finding out which publisher they're going with. There's a couple in question and I don't want okay. to do any more than that. Yeah. Well, very, very good. Um, when that information is made available, uh, I will do the best I can to share it with the audience. Cause I think this is going to yeah. gain, uh, you know, some interest at least. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Rodney, thanks again for being a part of interview. I, I really, uh, you're, you're softball. Last question. Should people subscribe to Corio? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, please just subscribe. subscribe. Uh, it's why I think they should. Because I really do think that in every document of the council, the document could have gone one way or the other, and either way would have been bad. And it ended up being Comunio people who made sure that the center was held. And 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 that means that if we want to retrieve the Second Vatican Council properly, we really need to understand what that community of voice is. That doesn't mean that the articles in there are infallible or any of that nonsense. I mean, it can't be infallible. Yeah, but they, they set the tone. And they, yeah. they set the tone in a helpful way. And it's the best deal around for an academic journal. Uh, yeah. If you don't believe me, go to communio-icr.com. Uh, folks, that, that's all we have for today. I need to remind you all, from Paleocrat Diaries to your living room, Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori.